Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hello, everyone. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our podcast here at SIPE. And I am joined by our friend and colleague at SIPE, Lars Benson. He is the regional director for Africa and all the way from Italy, not here in the United States. Take a little time over there. How are you, Lars? Very good. Thanks, Ken. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And you're literally staying in a 16th century monastery, correct? (laughs) <laughs> I am. I, I'm lucky. I'm fortunate enough that we have a, a wonderful uh, property in Italy, just north of Rome, and it hasn't been getting much use uh, because of the COVID crisis. Uh, we normally run an art school and cooking school out of it. So it's always, a, it's. I can sleep 30 people here. So you, you're more than welcome to come in and visit. Well, you know, we could change the uh, podcast to uh, Lars Adventures in Italy <laughs> rather than Democracy <laughs> Leaders. We, we could do a whole series on uh on Rome and Italy and everything. I think that would be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Let, let's get to what we're going to talk about today. We're also joined by a friend of site. His name is Professor Jonathan Arimu. He is also a consultant to uh, the government in Nigeria, specializing in the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. How are you today, Professor? Uh, thank you, Ken. It's an opportunity so, to be with you. Yeah, no, we're doing great. So Lars and I were talking just a few moments ago, but I think the audience would be really interested in in what you do and where you teach and what you teach. Let's talk a little bit about that. Thank you and the viewers. And it's an opportunity to be with you this evening in Nigeria, possibly morning over there in the U.S. And my friend Lars in Italy. My name, just as you said, is Jonathan Aremu. I'm a professor of international economic relations. My background has been in the Central Bank of Nigeria where I rose from an assistant economist to an assistant director of research before I retired to go and finalize my PhD degree in international economic relations. When I finished, I started lecturing in the university and I rose to become uh, the first chancellor of Covenant University. It's uh, number one in Nigeria now. We appreciate God for that. And then I lecture economics and uh, particularly issues relating to trade and investment that is my specialized area. In Central Bank of Nigeria, I was the one that developed the Investment Promotion Commission of the country in 1991 while I was in Central Bank of Nigeria. But uh, apart from the university, I'm a consultant to ECOWAS. I developed the investment code for the ECOWAS. I equally developed the trading services for the entire ECOWAS country, partnering with, with OCTAD. Then I work with uh, African Union, particularly on the incoming phase two of African continent of free trade area on investment. I'm a member of those people that develop investment protocol of African continent of free trade area, which we are going to start negotiating soon. But in the national economy, I'm a member of the National Action Committee on African continent of free trade area. I was one of those people that carried out the study that made Nigeria to sign African continent of free trade area. And uh, I'm equally privileged to have worked with Lars and the CIP as well as a consultant. In the study that we carried out last year, I was able to supervise the consultant that was engaged, that is CC, to be able to finalize the implication of African continental free trade area on the small and green business in Nigeria. So briefly, that is uh, what I am, so that not to waste much of your time. That is what RMO is. And then Lars knew everything about me already. That's why it's funny. Well, uh, you're certainly not wasting our, our time with your background. I think it's very interesting. Okay. And I think it, it uh, you've had a very interesting background in, in the work that you're doing with the government, I think is uh, is very important. Let's talk a little bit about the COVID crisis. You know, this is something that's really affecting almost every country on the planet. It certainly is here in the United States, and I know it has in Nigeria. Kind of give our listeners an update on what's going on there with the COVID crisis, and in particular, the impact that's had on the economy and in your specialty trade. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, COVID is becoming a very serious issue, and any analysis whether it is economic, political, or social interaction, that is not does not factor in the COVID crisis, is not a realistic one. So in Nigerian economy, well, just by this time of last year, we're hearing that COVID is uh, something of China. But just by the end of the month, and specifically by March last year, COVID came to Nigeria, and it has actually led to a, quite a lot of lockdowns. Traveling into African, West African state become difficult. Quite a lot of engagement I have with African Union on trade and investment. I could not travel. I was to go to Mali to go and sensitize 
that national economy on the investment code and policy that we just finalized, which uh, the 15 member states of Africa and West Africa actually adopted, but we cannot do it. They say it has to be done online. Since then, we cannot. So quite a lot of economic activity has been stagnated. And the most terrible thing about this is that uh, by the second quarter figure of Nigerian economy in year 2020, Nigeria entered a recession. And why? Because quite a lot of economic activities, as a result of lockdown, as a result of inactivity, as a result of further interaction that will have uh, a lot of economic activities, and if this is to work in the perfect order, they were not put in place. So Nigerian economy is being affected as well. And uh, even as at now, we have to move around covering our nose and mouth everywhere. And uh, also, you can't finalize everything on Zoom meeting or not that kind of a thing. There's need for interaction as well. But right. that. So unfortunately, COVID crisis have had a terrible effect on uh, economic interaction. And on African level, you know, initially African continental free trade area was scheduled to start on the 1st of July last year, but we did not start until January 1st this year. So which means that COVID has actually delayed the yeah. continental free trade area for completely six months. So which is a, a serious issue. And yeah. uh, even quite now, we are starting, but unfortunately, quite a lot of negotiations that we allow effective participation, they are not yet in place. So some of those negotiations are still in progress. All these things will have been completed before African continental free trade area commences. So briefly, that is what I can say on the implication of the COVID with regard to economic activity in Nigeria, in West Africa, as well as in Africa as a whole. It kind of put a delay in in the uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement. What impact has it had on supply chains in terms of slowing it down, getting goods to market? I'm sure it's created a delay in that as well, correct? Yes. Serious, serious, serious implication on the supply chain. Quite a lot of companies that are vertically integrated in terms of sourcing their input and selling their input abroad, they cannot get some of this thing done. And that's direct, it has direct implication on productivity for both our national economy, regional economy that's referred to as continental economy, as well as even the world. So it has serious impact on supply chain. And uh, more seriously is the fact that quite a lot of activities that we facilitate trade in terms of talking about uh, port activities and other trade financing management, they cannot take place as usual. And therefore, it has serious implication. And that's exactly one of the main reasons that I can for the recession which the Nigerian economy entered into the second time. So, Professor, let's talk a little bit about your work on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Professor, obviously, uh, Nigeria is one of the largest countries in Africa, if not the largest in terms of population. And, and large, it is, correct? I'm no expert on Africa, but it is the largest in terms of population, correct? Yes. And it has a massive impact on on trade on the continent. And so this is a very important uh, agreement. Can you explain to the audience what the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is all about and why it's important? Okay, thank you. The beginning of Africa Continental Free Trade Area can actually be seen right from the time countries in Africa gained independence since 1960. By 1963, the Organization of African Unity was put in place. And since that particular time, member states of African community wanted an integrated community that in which they can trade more among themselves, they can invest among themselves, and they can do more things since the colonial masters have actually left their country. You know, you can see that as a regional block, despite the fact that we are together in a block in the same continent, our trading activities have actually been with either the East or the West, more with uh, America, more with Europe. Now, imagine they coming up with uh, the east, Eastern part of the world. So Africa wanted to have a better trading relationship among themselves. And therefore, in 1980, there was a meeting, they call it Lagos Plan of Action. The Lagos Plan of Action was to put in place the process to be able to make African integration in terms of economic integration to come into, into being. That particular meeting ended up with another meeting, which led to African Economic Community Treaty, which is being tied to the Abuja Treaty of 1991. The Abuja Treaty of 1991 actually serialized the process which Africa will go through in terms of economic integration from a free trade area to custom union, from custom union to common market, from common market to economic union. 
And these are the known phases of economic integration. So African countries, they are very ambitious in terms of the kind of economic integration they wanted to pursue in line with the tested economic theory of uh, Jacob Vienna. So, but the starting point is a free trade area. And I believe that the others are familiar with it because in America, we have the NAFTA, which is uh, not Atlantic free trade area with America, Mexico, and uh, Canada, which allow goods to enter those three countries, those countries with less less uh, barriers. So similarly, African continental free trade area is the first step which Africa will tend to actually have among themselves, which is a free trade area. Let me say this one, that before this thing was reached, we have quite a lot of uh, regional bloc in Africa. We have ECOWAS, we have SADEC, that's South African Development Community, we have COMESA, we have the East Central Africa, we have the East Africa, we have the Maghreb, and quite a lot. Now, another very terrible thing about these regional communities in Africa was the fact that quite a lot of them were overlapping. Overlapping in the sense that, let's look at ECOWAS for instance. In the ECOWAS region, we have the English-speaking ECOWAS, we have the French-speaking ECOWAS, and then we have other regions. And as a result of this overlapping of jurisdiction of economic integration, it becomes so difficult for Africans to talk with one voice. So the head of state and government of Africa met and said, well, we are going to recognize only eight economic groupings. And therefore, having achieved that particular ambition of recognizing only economic subgroup, then came into force how to be able to implement the Africa Economic Community Treaty under the first phase, which is freighted area. And therefore, negotiations started 2015, and it was meant to be concluded in 2017. Unfortunately, it is delayed until March 21st, 2018 when it was concluded and signed in the Kigali, that's in Rwanda, on March 21st. And that is the beginning of African continental free trade area. At that meeting, four protocols, and I can say three protocols, plus one uh, a substantial agreement, they were reached. Number one, the agreement of trading services. Number two, agreement in uh, trading goods. And number three, the dispute settlement agreement. The other one is the framework agreement, which is number four. So now, and then, but... Having reached that particular signing, there is need to actually put it into process. Unfortunately, Nigeria that was instrumental right from the beginning of this process with a legal plan of action in 1980 and Abuja Treaty of 1991, Nigeria did not sign. Why? Because the government felt that there was not enough sensitization. For some of us that have been following the process, and uh, we said, no, Nigeria needs to sign because just as rightly identified, Nigeria in terms of the GDP is the biggest economy in Africa, in terms of the population is the most populous. And then from all this uh, kind of statistics, Nigeria is expected to actually benefit more. Even without African continental free trade area, we have quite a lot of large enterprises in Nigeria that can be found in other African countries. We have quite a lot of Nigerian banks that are doing extremely well in so many of the African countries. And quite a lot of services trade, like uh, internet services, which have their parent company in Nigeria. Now, African continental free trade area is expected to give legitimacy to all those institutions, as well as guarantee more opportunity for greater Nigerian uh, company to be able to go. So I was a member of the team that actually the government set up to look into the readiness of Nigeria. And then we looked into the readiness, and then we submitted a report to the government on in June. 2018, but yes, Nigeria is fully ready. So the government actually now look at it and then said that, okay, if that is the case, let us prepare what and what has to be ready. Then we prepared it. Then on the 7th of July 2019, uh, the head of state of Nigeria actually signed the African continental free trade area. And then immediately he signed it in the Nigeria Republic. He came back and then established National Action Committee. And because I'm the facilitator for trade, investment, and competitiveness for the Nigerian economy. I, remember, I, was, I became a member of the National Action Committee that uh, actually was to work on the process for Nigeria to ratify. Nigeria equally delayed ratification because we did our work, but government said that it's still consulting. So Nigeria finally ratified on the 4th of December last year, a day to the closing date, because the head of state met on the 5th of December to say that, well, with this number of countries that ratified, we can go into African continental free trade area on the 1st of January. So that is where we are in Nigeria. We are still a member of the National Action Committee. I believe strongly that Nigeria will benefit from this. But let me say that SAIB, Center for International Private Enterprise, did a very wonderful job. As early as 2018, SAIB started thinking of what to do to be able to make sure that Nigerian 
enterprises actually gain from this process, which is a very good initiative. And therefore, last last was came to Lagos and did a very good job. And based on the work that he did, an approval came from the headquarter that we should actually go into it. And then they supported with quite a lot of things. I was engaged as a, a consultant to facilitate the process. And I was able to use my experience in the entire process to be able to get this one done. And then by November last year, the report of the site was ready and it was sent. And it shows that, yes, this will be a very good thing for Nigeria. What SIPE has done is extremely wonderful and nice. And number one, that is going to be good that SIPE actually allowed this process to be carried out in other countries uh, of Africa uh, because of the fact that the sensitization, the study actually show some of the area that still have to be put in place to make sure that the treaty will be very good. But also in the process, it was discovered by that side uh, activity that seriously speaking, a lot still needs to be done. Well, let me say this because as an insider, I discovered that so much attention was paid under the side project to trading in goods, whereas trading in services is clearly very important. That area, I think that side will still have to do more to be able to ensure that trading in services, because that is an area where Nigeria has plenty of comparative advantage in terms of banks, in terms of quite a lot of our professionals that are actually existing in African countries, because without it, they will not be able to go out to be able to enjoy from the African continental free trade area. So I think that side we have to do something maybe in the next stage to be able to make sure that that aspect of trade, which is trading services, is actually captured. Professor, thank you for talking a little bit about uh, SIPE's work in this area, of which you've also been very much part of. But I think at the heart of this, it really goes down to being able to answer a, a pretty fundamental question. So how is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement going to particularly help small and medium businesses or small businesses, of which not only in Nigeria, but we know these are the the majority of businesses across Africa. And and Lars, if you don't mind real quick for our audience, because there's nuances in in what we mean by small and medium enterprises. You know, when, when the average person thinks of the small and medium enterprise here in the United States, it might be much different than what we would look at in, in Africa. Can you just briefly talk about what types of businesses we're talking about? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, the two questions are together. The small and medium scale enterprises in Nigeria they are they be very quite a lot of them will be micro enterprises in america by the time you look at uh, the amount of money in terms of classification but let us use our own classification here there are quite a lot of institutions that actually deal with them we have smida smida actually deal with small and medium scale development agencies in nigeria and then they have different categories in terms of uh, number of people that are working in terms of the amount of uh, capital base which they actually implement was essentially essentially not mining the categorization and not mining the different uh, definitions of small or small and medium scale enterprises whether in Nigeria or in America I think the, this small and growing business will be the first beneficiary of Africa continental free trade area why because this trading opportunity will provide for them a kind of vertical economic integration in which bigger companies can integrate backward into the domestic economy of African member states and source their input from there. And let me say this one also, that we have quite a lot of American companies. I've been working in Central Bank, and then I was in charge of foreign investment in Nigeria. I know the involvement in a lot of American companies in Nigeria. Even up to now, quite a lot of these institutions in America will be able to fare better because they will be able to have access to quite a lot of subcontracting activities, subcontracting activity of domestic small and medium scale enterprises in terms of sourcing their input. And this one will actually benefit quite a lot of small and medium scale enterprises in Africa. So my friend, Mr. Salah, that is in charge of African region, I can see quite a lot of businesses that he has been actually bringing up. They are going to germinate faster than ever before because of African continent of free trade area. Why did I say this one will be possible? It's going to be possible because Trading among these uh, companies will not be letters of credit that are opened in dollar, or opened in pounds, or opened in euro. But payment will be made in the domestic currencies. Let's say that me now and La, who is my friend, not minding that is in Italy now, 
we, we are into economic integration and we have a payment and settlement system. When I'm importing from La, who is in Italy, right? Instead of paying La in the dollar, right? I will just pay La in the domestic currency in Italy, right? How will I do that? If a particular item costs just $2, he's going to actually, what is the equivalent of that $2 in Italy? And that's what is going to take in domestic currency. And then over here in Nigeria, right? So what I will I be able to pay? I'll just pay the amount of that currency in Naira, which is the currency of Nigerian economy. And among the both the Central Bank of Italy and the Central Bank of Nigeria, there's going to be a sort of a, um, clearing in which quite a lot of product imported here, quite a lot of product imported in another country. At the end of the day, the difference is what is going to be paid in the uh, international currency. What are we saying? And this one will be networked even to the smallest individuals. Somebody can just use his telephone to be able to make payment into Kenya for that thing good that is buying. And the payment will be done in the domestic currency. And such an individual will be charged over here in Nigeria in Naira. So that the use of hard and in foreign exchange will not be there. And this process is carried out by Pan African Payment and Settlement System under the management of Africa, which is African Import and Export Bank. We have a similar one which has started in Ecowas, which is Ecowas Payment and Settlement System. In fact, Africa came to come and learn, uh, listen to this one from us when we started, because we started this process since uh, 2009, when I actually started working in Ecowas uh, region. So small and medium scale enterprises are going to benefit a lot. So Lars, what do you think from a site point of view? And, and you know, obviously you look at uh, all the countries in, in continental Africa, ex except for the northern part. Um, what type of effect do you think this will have or the potential on economic growth in, in, in jobs, both in Nigeria and uh, in the countries who are involved in this? Seriously speaking, yes. This will lead to substantial employment. If okay, it, great. The little that uh, Saeb did in December, um, Jan um, November, December last year, they have sensitized a small and uh, growing business in Nigeria. And this is why I see asking questions. Every day, I continue asking different questions. Even the consultant that was engaged about a month ago came to me that they want to do certain things. Can I assist them? I said, it's because you are coming from Saipo. If not, I will have charged you. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is that <laughs> it's, it's going to be a lot of a lot of employment generation opportunities. Right. Because the practical Well, I think Professor Remo, we we've seen, you know, having experienced the, the free trade agreements in the United States, there was uh, a lot of changes that happened and and I think overall the assessment in the United States was that uh, the the NAFTA as you referred to it that has recently been renegotiated and approved was, uh, you know, it was uh, overall, it was good for, for the country, but there were definitely certain industries and sectors that were affected. And it did uh, create, there were some issues in terms of things being not necessarily competitive. But I, I want to ask you, you know, I want to look forward, especially since January 1st, we know that the ACFA has essentially begun and is, uh, is, uh, has begun functioning. We know that we now have, um, an ACFA secretariat as well. And we know that all of these different countries are trying to go through the process of implementation. So my question to you is when we talk about the process of implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, what needs to happen still in Nigeria and across the continent for this to truly be successful? Excellent. That's a very wonderful question. Uh, why? Because that is the real issue. Well, let me start by saying this, that under NAFTA, which is a free trade area, there are challenges and there are opportunities. Under any free trade area agreement, there will be challenges, there will be opportunities. But the opportunities usually are more than the challenges. Why? Because as a result of openness to competition, clearly speaking, some inefficient industry we have to go because goods can actually come from other uh, competing economies that are members of the community. And that exactly is why countries like Mexico are crying. That uh, well, they are not benefiting from this. But having seen that one, that is not to say that free trade area is not beneficial. It is because the good thing is what we see in Europe. But coming back to the preparedness of countries in a lot of African countries, you are very right in that question. Let me say this one: that 
Corona crisis and virus has actually denied a lot of countries the necessary preparedness which they need to put in place. And as a result, even in Nigeria, one problem that we have, which I believe that uh, CIP can still look into, is that up to the time I'm talking to you now, we have ratified African continental military area, but it has not been domesticated. Without domestication, if you actually go into any dispute issue, there is no domestic law that can adjudicate for you. So, so it has started, but it has not been domesticated. And there are quite a lot of articles in the Nigerian constitution which say that whatever is the government pronouncement, unless it is decided by National Assembly, that thing cannot actually come into effect. And I think this one happened also to the United States. Why? When the Havana uh, Treaty was concluded to the setup of ITO, you know, both World Bank and IMF were set up, but ITO could not take off. Why? Because Americans said, well, you cannot actually suggest, uh, I mean, subject the American system to international negotiation like that. And therefore, the Congress said that, no, we are not going to accept. So it's not a new thing. So what I'm saying is that there's need for domestication. That has not been done. Not only that, there are actually still some issues that need to be finalized, like the rule of origin. Now, what percentage of certain products will actually be classified to be said, this is a product coming from Nigeria, this is a product coming from Ghana, this is a product coming from Kenya, upon which it will be granted a free entry without import duty. So quite a lot of this has not been finalized. And then an area which I said earlier, is the fact that, yeah, trading in services is so important, but there is no mutual recognition agreement yet. As a professor, I want to one lecture in Kenya. We Kenya recognize my professorial attainment. It can only do that if there's a mutual recognition agreement and there are relevant articles within after, just as we have in WTO, that actually say there is need for mutual recognition agreement before trade in services can actually cross border. So quite a lot of countries, particularly Nigeria, Quite a lot of professionals have not been able to have a mutual recognition agreement with other African nations for them to be able to participate. So these are some of the areas which side we have to help, not only Nigeria, the entire Africa. So, Professor, you know, as we're wrapping this up, I wanted to really ask you a question. You've been instrumental in, in terms of trying to convince the government of Nigeria to actually accept, and, and, and your work has been instrumental in getting Nigeria to sign on to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So now that you have, you sort of have a, a grandfather responsibility in terms of, of nurturing and taking care of uh, this uh, new uh, free trade agreement, what are you going to be doing in the next uh, six to 12 months in terms of in Nigeria and, and across the continent? Do you have any special plans? Are you going to continue to be working on ACFA? Are you going to continue to be writing about it? Are you going to continue to be teaching? What are your specific plans in the near future? Well, thank you very much for that question. That's a very nice one. Let me say one thing, that uh, I've taken a leave from my university because of the commitment I have at ECOWAS level, at national level, and at African Union. So I do a lot of my teaching when I have the time. I'm not even on salary. I make sure that I'm not on salary so I can actually move. And then the little knowledge I have, I can allow it to actually go. And then um, I'm happy for what SAIP did, but I'm looking forward also for SAIP to actually have quite a lot of programs to be put in place to help these helpless economies. <laughs> so, and I'm ready to work with SAIP also as I'm working with the African Union. Because on what basis? Is working in African Union. I, mean, I was instrumental to the development of Pan African Development Code, which is a new, we finished that in Mauritius 2016. It's not going to be used for the development of uh, the protocol for the entire Africa. But in West Africa, we are not even having a good thing. So in December last year, I was in Ghana to set the chief negotiator. Well, Professor, thank you so much. It's been an enjoyable, uh, fast 30 minutes. We barely scratched the surface of this issue. And, and Lars, I, I want to thank you once again for, for coming in and, uh, and helping out with this pro podcast. And you always do a terrific job. Uh, but Professor, I'd, I'd love to uh, get you back on the program in the near future because this is a very important topic to both Nigeria and, and the region. So thank you both. And we'll see everybody next time. Take care. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ken. Thank you a lot. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.